Hi friends, wish you all a poetic morning from Toronto. Hope you are all well there and enjoying the seasons as per your respective time zones. Well, in the fifth episode of the limited video series of literary and critical conversations and initiative of Setu, I present to you yet another important personality who is, to quote him in his own words, a freelance photographer, graphic designer, paralegal, assembler of heart walls, and a lot more. In short, he calls himself a jack of all trades. I am Sangeeta Sharma and on behalf of Setu, I take the opportunity to introduce you to this leading American author, artist and photographer, Jerome William Berglund. Jerome Berglund is a writer and fine artist who co-wrote a television pilot which at a festival for them received numerous accolades, including best in show. He graduated summa cum laude from the University of Southern California's cinema television production program with emphasis in screenwriting and philosophy. Berglund is furthermore, an established award-winning fine art photographer whose black and white pictures have been exhibited in galleries across New York, Minneapolis, and Santa Monica. In another life, he worked as a visual effects artist for Lucasfilm and DreamWorks and assisted on set at Lifetime and Comedy Central. He has the unique privilege of being able to say he was once Mini Driver's driver. Berglund is a committed activist as well and has been actively involved in the Occupy, Standing Rock and Black Lives Matter movements and supported grassroots efforts promoting the Green Party. Jerome Berglund currently resides in the Longfellow neighborhood of Minneapolis, which was the locus of George Floyd protests and was present there during the unrest. On behalf of Setu, I extend a very welcome, very warm welcome to our dear Jerome William Berglund. I'm so grateful to be here. Thank you, Sangeeta. I want to thank Setu Bilingual Journal, Setu Press, um, English editor Sunil Sharma, uh, publisher Anurag Sharma, you guys are doing such an amazing job and it's just such a constant source of inspiration and the whole writing and arts communities are just forever in your debt. So thank you for having me. And now to set the tone, I read out one of its excerpts, which is a translation. The original Swedish poem by Gunnar Wennerberg was translated by Berglund and published in September, 2022. The poem is titled Swedish Redemption. Here it goes, freedom lives in the North. Free was to George land, free as long as Saga remembers. And in the mountains, Syria is still free, free long as irons forged in embers. 
Once from east trolls in dragon ships did roam to bequeath our lives and lend us our home. Manly courage to the last breath, give us freedom or give us death. May our Swedish redemption be. That's a wonderful composition of yours. I felt like reading it right at the beginning. Hey, Jerome. Uh -huh. Now, the first question to you. May we know Jerome William Berglund in third person singular? You absolutely may. It's a it's a great pleasure to be here and to, to know everybody. Um, I've made so many wonderful connections in the in the writing and arts communities. Um, it's such a brilliant sort of international place to just connect and sort of have these meaningful conversations with colleagues and friends and forge these valuable friendships. Yeah, that's quite a fascinating introduction. How did your journey as a poet, as an artist, as a photographer commence? I mean, I've kind of been doing some version of creating things since a young age. Um, I was fortunate enough to, to make it into the cinema television program for college. So I was able to do some formal training. That was really, it took a lot of work to, to get in there and it was, it was really difficult, but I learned a lot. And I was very fortunate to sort of have some just amazing professors and just sort of work with some extraordinary colleagues. And I've kind of just been, since graduating, I haven't always worked in the arts. You know, I've done some really weird things to kind of get by and to make a, you know, to make ends meet, but uh, I've always kind of had this passion and it's great to be getting into it, diving kind of head first for the last couple of years, a little more, a little more adamantly. Mm -hmm. His writings strive to engage with significant social and economic movements of our day, which align with missions of decolonization and abolition across all ex existing institutions. Friend, will you please tell us what about uh, your recent poetry book, uh, Singing Bowl and Bathtub Poems? How's it going? Oh, it's been wonderful. Yeah, it's been it's been really exciting. I, I'm so grateful to Setu Press for for bringing this into the world. Um, I was kind of you know the whole querying process, trying to find a home for your for your book. It takes a while and it's very difficult. So it's so wonderful to to finally have it out there and have people reading it and have friends enjoying it. And a lot of people have been reading it. It's I've kind of self published some stuff in the past and I haven't had that that amount of readership. So it's been just so fun and exciting and all these people I really admire and respect have been sort of just holding my book in their hands and checking out the poems and it's pretty fun. Yeah, that's been wonderful. Great. Our best wishes for the commercial and critical success of this book of yours. You are very active on social media, especially on Twitter. So what's your experience of the reception of your works there? Yeah, Twitter is just an extraordinary space for sort of meeting new people and connecting with, you know, with publishers, with uh, with artists. I made just amazing friends. I was really fortunate. Um, I wasn't on there before. Uh, an editor friend, um, David McMurray, he's the editor of the uh, Asahi Shimbun newspaper of Japan. It's kind of a one of the main kind of international hubs of sort of English language haiku, and he's just a legend. I mean, he's. But uh, he was like, you got to get on the Twitter. You got to, you know, share this with people. You got to, he really encouraged me to sort of join up. I've been a little bit skeptical and I'm so happy I did because man, the, just the friends I made and the opportunities I've sort of learned about. And there's so many people on there sort of sharing information and teaching you things and directing you to material. And yeah, it's, a, it's a beautiful space. I mean, it's not perfect. You know, there's a lot of, there's some problematic aspects with sort of the, some of the ownership and some of the sort of misinformation and 
you know, nothing's perfect, but uh, it's got a lot of really positive aspects. I, there's so many people I wish were on there. You know, I wish everybody would get on there and just kind of connect because certain people, it's like, I'd love to be sharing their work. You know, they're writing this great stuff and it kind of only exists in these, you know, print journals and Twitter allows you to share things with people and just kind of, it really amplifies a message. So it's, it's a wonderful tool. Great. We well know that you draw good traffic for your posts. That speaks volumes for your fan following. You are actually a youth icon already. <laughs> Nothing like that, but uh, I am fortunate to have great friends on there. What is the secret behind your very productive and prolific career as a highly visible artist? I'd say a big part of that, I'd, I'd chalk up to the 10,000 hour rule. You know, they say it takes 10,000 hours to kind of become become a master at anything. And I mean, I'm I'm not there yet, but uh, I'm putting in the time and so much of this stuff, it's kind of a numbers game. You know, they when you start out, they tell you, expect 60 rejections for any, you know, if you have a short story you're trying to place, mm -hmm. you're going to have to send that thing out 60 times before you find it at home. And, I'm getting better numbers, you know, each time, you know, you get a little bit better, you get a little bit tighter, your your cover letter gets a little bit more professional, your bio gets a little bit more enticing, but all this stuff, it's like, you know, everybody starts at the bottom and you're just kind of, you're working hard and you're perfecting your craft and you get a little bit better every day, you know, just kind of these little baby steps. Yeah, there's a lot of hard work in it, but human beings can just try and rest depends on the luck and the fate. Reading one of his haikus will be more than appropriate here. I render one that found place in the 14th Yamadera Basho Memorial Museum English Haiku Contest. Green and shiny, flits in small arcs, stone across pond algae. Okay, now the next. You dwell the most in Haiku, Haiga, Senrayu, and Tenka, and are one of the leading Haikuists of the world. What makes you prefer this short form of poetry? And why is this fascination with Japanese poetic forms? Yeah, the, the haiku and the send you and the, the tanka, I mean, they're just such wonderful ways to sort of really say things concisely and to sort of capture these moments. You know, the haiku moment is kind of what they describe it as, but these these concrete sort of a just bursts of, you know, meaning. Um, I mean, we're sort of in a soundbite driven culture. Things have gotten, people have such short attention spans, you know, you have to really wow them. Almost, you know, things have kind of turned into tweets and into, you know, those little sort of um, sound bites in the news. And I mean, I wish people would read, you know, uh, Tolstoy. Or, you know, uh, I'm, I'm right now. I'm trying to read um, Milton's Paradise Lost, but it's like most people just don't have that either the time or just sort of the the focus. You know, we're so sort of ADHD. I mean, a, a haiku. I can send that to my friends or my family, people that don't know anything about poetry. And they can read it. You know, they have time. It's a it's a yeah, meme. It's, it's a shareable a thing. Very short. Most people, a short story is a lot harder to sell. I mean, mm -hmm. there was um, um, a famous a famous writer. It was um, Voltaire. Voltaire said that you know mm -hmm. there's no danger in a thousand page book, a doorstop, a doorstop. You know, nobody's gonna read it. A doorstop can't really make that much of an impact, but like a, a, a pamphlet, you know, a flyer, kind of the equivalent of a, you know, a flyer can like start a revolution. I mean, a flyer can change people's lives, can really teach people things, you know, they got, they created, I mean, they abolished slavery, they gave people the vote, they, you know, they gave women rights that didn't previously exist. I mean, that stuff was accomplished through not through giant books, but through, you know, pamphlets, through signs that people were waving around. You know, they said, this is wrong. And people started changing, changing their minds about things. So, I mean, a haiku is sort of a, a very accessible, very immediate thing that we could use 
the you know helping fix the environment to help you know critique inequality or all these things that we need to fix it's like writing a thousand page book isn't going to do anything but a nice haiku somebody might read that you know it might really have some positive impact so that's that's what i love about the haiku and the standing you for sure quickest readable piece of poetry in this fast paced world what else does a modern human being want <laughs> Yeah. What, what do they want? Sorry, could you repeat that's the question? What, that's what a modern human being always looks for. The quickest, the shortest uh, readable poem. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, you're, you're totally right. You couldn't be more right. I mean. So that's the reason uh, you are writing haikus mainly, right? Haiku. It's kind of why it's kind of why it's become such a powerful sort of a accessible thing i mean internationally the i forget the like the asai shimbun we we're talking about japan they're publishing people writing english language haiku from like 60 countries i mean there's people you know i have a really good friend um from ghana and now he's in the uk or he's in um new zealand right now but there are people just in every country just writing these extraordinary haiku and english has sort of become one of the main languages just because you know it's so spoken by so many people but but it's a really great way for, you know, people in just anywhere to sort of really, you know, speak to the world on sort of a global stage and have people reading, you know, reading about what's going on in, you know, Norway or in, you know, in the Philippines or just anywhere. Like they can sort of reach people through this, these tight little, little verses. It's brilliant. Yeah, sometimes they're brilliant, profound, hardly 17 syllables, but they make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, translation is a difficult art, we all know. One has to add, rearrange, or remove words for the translation to make sense in the target language. Languages do not have exact uh, equivalences for every word, for every phrase when it's being translated. May I ask you to please elaborate on your translation choices? How do you select translation? Like which text needs to be translated? And also the challenges that you face when you do it. Yeah, it's so interesting thinking about translation. It's kind of what I started out at a really young age, really interested in um, a lot of the sort of comic books coming out of Japan, manga. They were, uh, they were something that just all the people my age were sort of reading. And when you're sort of interested in that, it kind of brings you to translation and it kind of brings you into sort of this, this sort of bridge between cultures, between, between time periods. I mean, haiku, it's all, you know, you're sort of, when you're reading, you're engaging with, you know, Matsuo Basho or Kobayashi Issa or, or Busan. I mean, we're kind of, you know, those are three, three people like a hundred years apart and some guy in America is just kind of, you know, you pick up a book and suddenly you're you're traveling through time, through space. You're you're learning about all these different cultures and these different sort of connections between people and finding the commonality and sort of the, you know, the shared spiritual and sort of you know all these things that that sort of bring human beings together. I mean, finding kind of a common language, kind of this globalism that we're we're striving towards. Translation is a great part, important part of that. Um, with uh, with the Gunnar Wennerberg book, I still got to find a home for that. It's something where it's probably going to need, you know, somebody with a little more. I just wanted to read it. I was I was walking by this statue in the park, and you know, what well, we've been, this thing's been there for a hundred years, and there's almost not a word in English by this guy until I I kind of put my mind to it. You know, dozens of people every day just walk by the statue, take their picture and just say, I'd love to read that guy's work. You know, why can't I read this guy's work? Where is it? And finally, I just, you know, I mean, we're, we're just so fortunate to be in this age. I, I couldn't have done it without the help of, uh, you know, these tools like Google translate and these amazing dictionaries of, you know, between Swedish and English, it's like we have at our fingertips. I mean, there's so much, just a wealth, just troves of great art out there. That's just never, never made the transition between languages. Another thing I've been working on, um, the author of um, Phantom of the Opera, Gaston Leroux, 
he had this whole series of books and only a handful of them that have ever been translated into English from the French. But it's like with, with all these tools, we can, you know, just an average layman can sort of plug things in and just kind of tweak them about and get their dictionary. And it's like, suddenly we can, we can be reading stuff from, you know, a hundred years ago from the French. It's amazing. It's so exciting. Yes. There's some uh, extraordinary translation going on between English and Hindi too. There's a great journal called Tria, Tria Journal, mm -hmm. and they're publishing English language haiku translated into Hindi, which is, I mean, there's kind of the, the vice versa you find, but it's really exciting to be, if you have any uh, Hindi speaking listeners, I highly recommend checking out Tria. It's extraordinary. It's a beautiful, beautiful journal. And they're just doing such cool things. They have the nicest editors. Sure. Yeah, wonderful work is going on in translation, and only then uh, there is more, you know, readability. To enhance the readability, it is essential that works get translated. So it's a wonderful thing you are doing. Thanks for your insights. And now I render one of your poems titled "A White Cockatiel." This was published for Vinetka Northfield Library Poetry Contest, November 2022. And he says he was placed second in the contest. So congratulations once again for that. Here it goes. Shyly said hello, then volunteered softly that she loved me. But alas, I would not be the one to get her out of her cage. Why I generally avoid such dismal places, charming though their captive specimens may prove. Searching for rat part, been trying to find way there, since cannot remember. So, What's your aesthetics as a photographer of great renown, Jerome? What kind of visual images appeal to you the most? It's so uh, it's so funny. We were, you asked that question earlier about sort of what brought me to haiku. Um, before I really started writing haiku kind of in any quantity, I was I spent a couple of years <clears throat> not really writing anything, just doing doing a lot of photography, kind of taking nature photographs. I was a uh, I was a little bit in a bad headspace. I just had a, I was working these, you know, seven days a week, 12 hour, 16 hour shifts. And I just kind of in my free time, I only really had the energy to sort of take photographs, but um, the photographs I was taking, they were black and white nature pictures. I was just drawn to this sort of aesthetic of sort of, you know, kind of things falling apart, things sort of, you know, leaves falling and things sort of being breaking down um almost like a distressed wood sort of aesthetic and actually oddly enough the within the sort of eastern poetic aesthetic sort of a uh, ideal there's this concept two concepts um techniques they're called um sabi and wabi sabi is a kind of means to rust um it's sort of associated with like the fall and just sort of like you know paint peeling and old old wooden things and um wabi is kind of this the beauty and poverty sort of you know kind of a wintry sort of things being just really austere and sort of um minimalistic and kind of these things that i was really drawn to in photography are just kind of like the the same subject matter that they're sort of that are really an important part and kind of a backbone of haiku and just sort of eastern art in general so it's really interesting that those things kind of, there's this sort of Venn diagram overlap. I know your photographs are much in demand and they keep getting published in different journals, different platforms. Yeah, I've been really fortunate. It was crazy to have sort of a little, I had them sort of in a, a little gallery show going on on a wall in, in a New York gallery. That was kind of my biggest excitement was I didn't get to go there in person, but I could sort of see it through. They had sort of... um kind of a virtual tour where you could but people were like buying them and I mean you know it wasn't like like anything fancy or anything but it was still pretty exciting so just to get a couple things in a couple of galleries it's really really been a 
really um, validating for sure. Having Irish roots, you share your ancestry with the likes of Joyce, Swift, and Shaw. Has this shared tradition contributed towards shaping you up as an artist? Absolutely. It's something that I'm kind of only getting more aware of as, as I get older and I kind of read more of those classics. I've been fortunate enough to kind of really catch up on some of those books and I still have plenty to read, but um, yeah, I mean, the, the work of Swift and um, Joyce both have just been a huge influence on me and kind of the uh, Swift, I mean, he has such a gift for satire, sort of for, I mean, his stuff was so not political. I mean, the, the word political sort of implies that it's sort of this partisan thing that divides people. And the way he sort of critiqued things sort of smilingly with, you know, he, he made people laugh, but, you know, he changed minds and he sort of, he made people think. And to be able to do that, I mean, it's such a gift to sort of not, not alienate, to sort of, to be welcoming and inclusive while sort of guiding people toward better, better cultural decisions, better you know, treatment of human beings and human rights. I mean, yeah, Gulliver's Travels is just one of the most important books ever written. And Joyce too. I mean, the the, the work Joyce did was sort of stream of consciousness and sort of, I mean, he, he had some really big, important ideas about how some of these, you know, repressive institutions were just so sort of traumatizing to him as the young man. My, um, my primary school years when I was real young, I was sort of a, we weren't, poor exactly but we weren't you know we were sort of in this wealthier sort of more affluent kind of community and we were definitely on the you know poor compared to a lot of our neighbors and just kind of the that awareness of class at a young age and sort of we were in kind of a repressive school system it was still pretty you know fundamentalist kind of traditionalist and it wasn't exactly like corporal punishment but it was kind of like right on the edge of that where it was sort of you know moving out of these really antiquated sort of dangerous methods of you know sort of imparting information on the youth and that definitely had a big impact on me and sort of solidified kind of my moral compass growing up for sure made me empathize maybe more empathetic with with you know people and all, all kinds of different people I mean so in a sense I was really fortunate to sort of be a little bit in just kind of a rougher kind of more intense you know sort of childhood Mm -hmm. So it did have a very positive impact on you as a person, as an artist. Absolutely, yeah. All those, <clears throat> all those traumas of our youth, you know, the and all those sort of mistakes we make. I mean, God, I've made, I've made plenty of mistakes, you know. But it's like we learn from all those, you know. It's like it's so important to sort of make those mistakes and to get your hands dirty and to just sort of fail miserably and just sort of you know, pull yourself up from that. It's, I mean, all the, every one of those moments is sort of a teachable moment. You know, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go back and do it any other way. I mean, you know, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for kind of a series of just crazy things going, you know, you try this, you try that. It's like, eventually you start figuring stuff out. You know, it's only through these kind of the school of hard knocks that we really start to figure out what, what is right and sort of what, what we should do. Especially when you read their biographies, you come to know about their fears, their inadequacies, which they candidly share with the readers. Yeah, biographies are just extraordinary. Um, a lot of the, the writing I've done has been heavily based on sort of, I'm so interested in the lives of these artists. You know, I've been reading a lot about like John Keats and just kind of like the, just the intense years he had sort of grappling with all this stuff. And I mean, all these, you know, poets and uh, artists too, you know, painters like Vincent Van Gogh, it's like the amount of just chaos he sort of had to weather and he didn't, he did an amazing job. I mean, he didn't, he sold about two paintings in his lifetime and he still went on to sort of make the, the best art the world has ever known. And it's like, it's so unfortunate sort of our, our society kind of isn't willing to, give those people more recognition in their lifetimes. You know, it's one of those things where like the photographer Vivian Meyer, she became huge, but only after her death, you know, they kind of waited till it's like, it's, it's sort of sad that she wasn't able to sort of, 
experience that appreciation in real time. That's But we're true. getting better. And for kids, yes. Kids, Shelly as well. Yeah, oh, totally, exactly, yeah. for sure. Yeah, I love Shelly. But Definitely. within their short span of uh, creative writing span, they have written works that are now being read by posterity and like they are brilliant works. Yeah, oh, 100%. They are lighthouses. Era. I should call them lighthouses. Lighthouses, that's that are brilliant. So great. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, how the digital literary journals have facilitated the growth and dispersal of fine arts that is visual and written forms of art. Yeah, we're so lucky to kind of be be here in this specific time and place. Um, things are just so much more accessible and so much more immediate than they were. I mean, for example, in the print world, I had some photographs accepted and I think it was like four or five years ago and just just made it to print like, you know, a month or two ago. It's like, which is wonderful. I mean, I'm so happy it's, you know, I can, it's in print, but it's like, I mean, the beauty of having, you know, a journal like Setu or, you know, so many of these places that I, that I go every day and they're posting new stuff every day. It's like, you can, with these beautiful, you know, submittable and these kind of, or just email based submission things, you can have something submitted and the turnaround is just, and the, you know, the lack of expense. I mean, I mean, it's possible with like a Wix or a website like that to sort of have a really modest little operation and not be spending a dime. I mean, compared to the, the overhead that people had to spend, you know, having, having printing presses and, you know, printing, for example, if we wanted to, if we wanted to make a book like this a couple of years back, you would have had to, you know, print a couple hundred copies and then, you know, pay the printer and have them sitting there in boxes and store them. And then you'd be shipping them, spending how much for shipping. I mean, nowadays, as horrible as Amazon can be, you know, Amazon doesn't, they're not perfect. They do a lot of pretty frightening and sort of, you know, monopolistic and kind of abusive practices with their, their employees, but just for accessibility for an audience, you know, you can crank off a book and have it, you know, if you own, if you have a prime subscription, you can get that thing shipped for free to you for, I mean, a book for $3. I mean, that's great. Somebody wants to read, you know, so many of these books I want to read by, um, kind of the bigger small presses, they're about $20 for a, for a, you know, 50 page chat book. And it's like, I mean, I want to order them. I want to order all of them. I just don't have all that money. You know, it's a, it's a real, it's a real accessibility thing for, you know, it kind of makes that those books only available to a fairly privileged readership, you know, with a lot of, um, sort of a discretionary income and I mean the beauty of like you know Setu Setu is there like you know all you need is to click on it like you can read I mean brilliant writing and short stories and art and poetry it's right there at your fingertips you know it's and it's coming monthly I mean it's I mean you're changing lives with what you're doing like I mean there are all these these New York Times that are subscription based and you got to spend ten dollars for a journal and deal with all that stuff it's like nobody's you know, a really select few kind of bourgeois people are sort of, you know, I mean, you're really consigning your work to a market that, you know, isn't really accessible to the, the masses. I mean, there's definitely sort of a class aspect to that too. And, you know, these free online journals, I mean, they really are just a righteous, you know, a morally superior option than these, these sort of elitist sort of, you know, I mean, it's definitely a positive thing in the long run, yeah, for sure. It's definitely a new cultural paradigm. Living in a networked society with technological and virtual space has opened up so many newer avenues of communication. Here we are practicing that. Otherwise, it wouldn't it's have been possible. Jerome, you have done... Yeah, uh, an occasional podcast also what your experience yeah, yeah. Uh, I was fortunate enough to join a podcast recently um it, it's called the culinary saijiki it's hosted by uh the very talented Allison Whipple Allison Whipple is 
I mean, she does all kinds of stuff. She's just a, she's a genius. And she's right now, she's the editor of the, uh, the monthly, um, the monthly Haiku Society of America. They send these amazing sort of a membership sort of a newsletters every month. So she's been doing that. She's editing this year. She's editing the, um, the membership anthology. It's going to be amazing. Um, she's been guest editing a lot of different journals, but she has this podcast. It's called the Culinary Side Jiki, and she sort of discusses um, uh, the idea of Kigo, season words, Kigo, they're called. They're, uh, they're an important part of haiku, and she sort of finds the intersection between sort of season words and uh, food and cooking because she's such a genius about cooking. But um, I was on her show, and we just had a great chat. It was a lot of fun. It's a wonderful podcast. Um, yeah, there's um, there's so many fantastic podcasts out there, especially ones kind of related to the haiku. Um, Another great one is uh, Poetry P. I, uh, I have some great friends that work with Poetry P. It's hosted by Patricia McGuire, and she just she's phenomenal. I mean, she's just such a genius, and she brings the most interesting people from around the world on there. Um, another podcast I really, really enjoy a lot, um, Elizabeth McDuffie uh, hosts it. It's called the Meat for Key, Key Cast. Um, they, uh, they have the Meat for Tea Journal, and they have sort of a paired a podcast and it's just it's extraordinary i can't recommend that highly enough it's a it's a beautiful one there's some wonderful podcasts out there right now for sure great um may we know what are your future literary projects yeah yeah a lot of a lot like of interesting stuff going. absolutely so the next thing i have dropping pretty soon um the book we released with setu um bath of poems it's kind of the first part in almost a trilogy of um of different sort of similar that were written kind of at the same time and there's two other ones um one of them meet for tea press actually we we're just talking about them um, meet for tea they're releasing it's called um funny papers um huh. that's going to be coming out real soon actually and it's a yeah, it's stuff that's a new website it goes uh, it goes really well with uh with bathtub poems um it's kind of from the same the same time period and it's kind of got a different theme but um it's it's similar writing um and then there's kind of a third one that one i don't for sure have a home for it now but um it might actually be um um Skaja evens she she's the editor for um it takes all kinds journal it's a it's a really cool really neat sort of gritty sort of diy like i mean they just have really cool stuff in there but um and they're actually looking for submissions if anybody's looking to submit work it takes all kinds journal um with skaji even but um they might be publishing the third one that one is called Eleusinian um solutions um so those are kind of oh there's something which may or may not be um yavanika press um edited by by uh, shloka shankar just the am amazing well-known beloved fascinating um poet she's she for many years edited sonic boom they're kind of sonic boom is an experimental poetry journal they're kind of taking a little bit of a break right now there but um her press yavanika is still open they're reading chapbooks right now if anyone's looking to place a chapbook and um she's uh she's right now considering another book of mine so you know i don't know it's not nothing's nothing set in stone or anything but uh, if possible that could be really fun and if not you know i'll find another home for it but uh but yeah yavanika press if you're ever looking to read some really, really cool, really neat sort of a uh, cutting edge, avant-garde experimental poetry, um, not just haiku, they do a lot of stuff. I mean, they they have some really neat collections, but I've read a good couple and I really like that press. So they're mm. another wonderful press. Great. So we, sh uh, we wish you the best for all your future projects. Soon they should see the light of the day. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Lots of stuff going. Yeah. Tons of yeah. stuff. I've been I've been so fortunate. It's been a busy couple of years. And I've been uh, I've been reading a lot of Sunil's books, too. If anybody's looking for something, something really good to read, Dr. Sunil Sharma. Oh, boy, can he write that short fiction? I've been just riveted. Um, He's got a good couple collections. I think I've read all of them now at this point. Are there four? But great reading. Highly recommended. Did you read Minotaur, his novel? I M Minotaur, I got to I have it on. I've read it. I've I just kind of read the first couple chapters of it, but uh, well, the chapters are longer. So I read the I read the introduction, and I was trying to finish his uh, short story collection first. But yeah, what a what a great start! What a what a phenomenal concept! Thank yeah, you. So anyone's good. looking for a good, I think it's won a lot of awards, right? It's been it's been really getting some some accolades, right? Yes, already he's getting awards for the same. 
That's extraordinary. Yes. Um, I just hope he gets more. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Whatever, whatever. I mean, it's such that kind of recognition. And it makes its that. way in Hollywood cinema. I yeah, would, Hollywood. Seriously. I wish I was still happy. That happens. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Heck yeah. That's what it's all about. Definitely. Any message to the budding artists, Jiru? Yeah, my message would just be don't give up. I mean, this stuff, you know, there's going to be rejections. The, even the even the best poets, you know, even the best authors, the best writers, you look at the history, you know, there's so many of these. Um, Sylvia Plath, she submitted to that darn, what was it, 17 magazine? She submitted like 47 times before they published her first poem. I mean, you know, so many of these, like Stephen King, I think he sent out Carrie like 50 times and eventually got angry and he like threw it in the trash and Tabitha King, she, she rescued the manuscript to his first book, his, his biggest success. She pulled it out of the trash. I mean, if he wouldn't have had a great wife who just believed in him, he would have never, you know, it would have just been in the trash. I mean, like there'd be no Stephen King. There'd be no it. There'd be no gunslinger series. You know, it's like, I mean, this stuff, you hit walls, you know, you hit brutal crushing walls and you just have to kind of just keep going. And it's like, this stuff you'll if you keep working if you keep submitting you know stuff will get accepted you'll find um a lot of this stuff too is about just sort of um mutual aid reciprocity sort of finding finding your tribe finding forging meaningful relationships um i mean so much of this stuff like you know i read a lot of a lot of books and I've made some amazing friends. I mean, some of the first friends I made in the writing community was just people whose work I was reading and I was loving it. And I was just kind of like, you know, celebrating their work and kind of writing reviews and just kind of emailing people and saying, boy, I really like this. This is amazing. You know? And I, I made some like really cool, um, my friend, Ajay Ageba, we, uh, we ended up collaborating. He was like my favorite, my favorite short form poet that I first discovered in reading some magazines. And like, we ended up recently doing a, doing a collection where he wrote some poems and I did some pictures and we put them together and it was really neat. It was super cool, but it's like, you know, nobody, don't be afraid to reach out to people and just get to know these. Another of my favorite, my favorite writers, um, JD Nelson. He's like, I've been reading that guy for years before I was ever on the Twitter. And somehow I was just enjoying his work so much. We ended up kind of chatting and he became like one of my best friends. Like we're just, we're really good buddies as well as like, you know, just, and I've just learned so much. He's kind of a mentor and he's just such a knowledgeable, cool guy. And he really, you know, he's just a genius and he just, he understands. And he's, he's also a really good haiku poet, but um, he's, he's best known for his sort of a kind of Dada sort of surreal stuff, but he's an amazing haiku poet too. But, but yeah, just, it's so funny how these people you really, you know, who are sort of your heroes kind of become your, become your friends and colleagues too. If you, if you kind of just get out there and so many people just kind of, you know, stay, sequestered in their little you know maybe out of fear maybe out of just sort of anxiety and I'm a really anxious person I'm a really nervous person so it's this stuff is hard for me too but it's like if you do do it if you just kind of you know suck it up and just kind of dive in there it's like nothing but good things you know there's nothing nothing bad's gonna happen if you if you get out there you'll just be happy you did I mean it's it's tough you know it, it can be draining but it's like it's definitely worth it I'm sure youngsters will benefit out of your tips. Oh, um, before I, before I forget, um, I have a pin tweet. I'll have to repin it, but um, I put it together. Maybe I'll I'll send it to Sunil to share. But um, it's got some really good tips and tricks on sort of publishing for people starting out, looking for for kind of the best practice, the most effective sort of means of. Mm -hmm writing cover letters or you know figuring out kind of how to put together a packet and I mean all this stuff you figure it out but uh it's better if somebody you know can kind of point you or work you through some of the some of the easy mistakes because it's like there there are things you can do to kind of make your odds better to kind of better understand things that if you if you do stuff a little bit smarter not harder you can really succeed That was a marvelous exchange of ideas. Indeed, it was great pleasure talking to you, Jerome. I'm sure the audience must also have enjoyed listening to you. A big thanks to you, Jerome, for taking time out despite a tight schedule. 
Thanks, Jerome. Thanks, viewers. In the next episode, we will present to you another important guest. Till then, bye-bye.